for session and basically you can like ask any question to any of us and get it answered hopefully so i don't know we usually just like give microphone to you and, yeah yeah Okay. So first we just do a quick uh, introduction so everyone just says who he is and what he's working on in Blender so you know who is sitting there and then you can ask us all the questions. So I guess we just start here with the lie. And we miss Campbell also and probably more people. Uh, <laughs> just report 10 bugs and he's going to come right away for the... My name is Dalai, Dalai Filinto. I'm a developer. I do a lot of bugs, a lot of things. I do I tend to use the Blender engine, do fish eye things related. I mean, working on stereo mode view, uh, cycles baking, and related things like that. My name is uh, Martijn. Um, I work on Windows platform support. It's more out of nobody. Well, Sergey does most of the work actually. <laughs> But um, and some cycle stuff now and then. Uh, well, that's it. I'm Jonathan Williamson. I'm not doing a whole lot of development, but mostly doing UI coordination with uh, Pablo and a couple other people just to work on the, the UI project. Yeah, <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Jeroen Bakker from AdMind. Uh, most, mostly uh, Blender 8, uh, Blend file format, and the compositor. Hello, I'm Sergey. I think that, that's enough. <laughs> Hi, I'm Thomas. Uh, I started with 2.5 UI and uh, mostly cycles these days. So uh, I'm Diana Sergey, uh, and I do you know, I do some rigid body stuff and smaller features and bug fixes, but not much <laughs> other than that. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> well, I'm an guy and I've been working on Blender code for about three years now and I'm employed by the Blender Institute since about a year now. And I'm mostly working on game day features and mesh tools, mostly. Campbell Barton, or IdeasMan42, and uh, do uh, Python API, mesh tools, bug fixing, maintenance, blah, blah. So I'm the other Thomas, Thomas Beck. I'm doing the Blender developer sneak peeks. I'm doing bug fixing and the wireframe modifier, lastly. I'm Anthony Riegetakis. I'm uh, doing mostly uh, painting tools, sculpting, and uh, recently the viewport project and the widget uh, project, and as well as some sequence uh, code. I stand up. Uh, my name is Julian Eiser, um, aka Severin, um, and I'm doing mainly user interface development and stuff like that. Yeah, my name is Andrea, and I've been yeah developing for quite some time, but with a uh, little less time in the last year, so I think I have five or six commits in the last year. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've been doing a little bit bug fixing and working in the user interface file browser area. Hi, I am uh, Ines Almeida. Uh, the nick is Brita. I am a recent developer from this year, and I work mostly on the game engine. and also mainly haven't done much last year but recently more on the compositor and a bit on Blender 101. Yeah, what? I'm Lucas Turner. Yeah, and come on. Oh. <laughs> test, uh, test. Yeah, I've been working on nodes and uh, particles in Blender and recently on uh, hair simulation. I'm working for the Gooseberry project. So 
enter tornado yet. The sheep nado, as it's called. And he loves particles. That's it. Okay, so this is the developer team. And <laughs> only a little part of it. So next year we do the opposite and we do a blender user ask me anything and then the developers can sit here and then the users can be on that side of the room, right? It's, uh, yeah. So what do you guys want to know from the users? Is there anything you want to know? No, or something? What? When can we drop the Is there a week that goes by where Blender doesn't crash or do something weird for any users? Who use Blender full time or fairly often? Whoa. 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 A stable version for a whole week. <laughs> so who's uh, frequently or sometimes reporting in the bug tracker? That's not really enough, man. You need everybody to report in the tracker, right? There's not enough bugs, right? Do I have anything else you guys want to know from the users? Or shall we swap? Yeah, you want to know. I did want to know, is Isaac a real Riley here, by any chance? Isaac really? Yeah? And just because you sent an email to the list saying that you wanted to get more involved, and no one know about you. No one, you didn't he reach out to anyone. So I hope you can still have some time before the conference to... So check out the other developments and all that. Yeah. Okay, so who has the first question for a developer or for all the developers? Start. I have a question for you. How is the viewport project coming along and the whole depth of field thing? So right now I'm uh, I, I'm working on uh, the compositing th part still, and uh, there is, I have to take care of a little bit of uh, passing data and blurring uh, the color buffers uh, around. And uh, basically, once I'm through with this, with, with this, which should be not uh, far away, about one or two days uh, far away, uh, I, we should have something working. So yeah. Are you, are you working with JSON at the moment? Uh, not, not really. This is independent of, of uh, the work JSON is doing. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we, we basically have to merge his branch sometime in the uh, one or two next releases. We're still reviewing some parts of the code, thinking about if some parts can be done better or avoid some code duplication maybe and stuff like that. Uh, we'll what, see. what do you think is possible for 273, the next release? Uh, some people have requested maybe that we have the effects like screen space ambient occlusion, maybe the, of course depth of field if it's possible. Some people have requested about free, uh, freestyle edges maybe. Uh, it may be easy to add. I, I have to look into it. The cavity shadings? Cavity shadings, yeah. The, the, uh, we can uh, use that, I guess. Come on, the modelers are dying for it, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, or not. Uh, you want to have cavity shadings in the sculpting and stuff? Yes, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, sure. Mm -hmm. Nobody watch it. <laughs> so full time sequencer, it's not. <laughs> I think I'm gonna be a bit controversial. So first I will be nice, and then I will gonna be a bit bad. So <laughs> first of all, thank you guys uh, for all your work you're doing. I mean, it's, it's fucking amazing. So I mean, really thanks a lot for for all you're doing. And second is a bit controversial. So it's like it's quite clear from just being here in the conference that. People use Blender for lots of different stuff. Um, so, for example, in my case, I use uh, it for architectural visualization. And there are some times that uh, I, it's, it's quite clear that some features that for some users would be like super important for others are not. Um, and I can give <laughs> a couple examples. So, is there any way that making the feedback from the users? And I know this is like really difficult. I have read it up a couple times in Blender Artists. I know that you guys got completely overflown by proposals and stuff like that, but just to give just to give a quick example, like for me it would be amazing, amazing to have white color uh, <laughs> billboard. Uh, I, this is the controversial. Like even if I could ask, like uh, whatever, I would have to have like different colors by object, by material, by groups, because I, you know the guys that. Layers in Blender are not the best feature, so I, I usually try to work with groups. And at the end, what I in architectural visualization, I, I have like lots of stuff. The building ramps are big, 
and I have like a big blob, green blob. And I know that for you, I mean, I know that the feedback that you guys get is usually mostly from the things that you're doing in the institute, which is normal because they are the people that you can trust and they're the people that they're doing. And probably for the films that you're doing, you don't care about that kind of stuff. So I don't know if there's any way, and if this is a really big question, and it's a controversial, so I've, I've, I was nice at the beginning, that we could give feedback that maybe it's also like gonna help, I mean, it's gonna help users that use Blender for things like not films, for example, and it's gonna probably, I don't know, like help each other, like probably some features you never thought of that, and probably that they can they can speed the, the workflow, I don't know. I know it's really big, sorry. But. Uh, the, the question is mainly, do you think uh, the wireframe colors are not acceptable as a feature, or what do you think then? No, for, for me, the problem is Why do you think it's not in Blender? Because when I make a group, it has that, for example, it has that color. I, I cannot, I mean, I know that I, I we have colors by object, and we have colors by material, but I know I'm the person with the evil genius who is not uh, always uh, happy <laughs> with <laughs> the simple things. I mean, there's nothing against wireframe colors, but there is something against doing things really stupid, which you will regret in a few, a few years. So when our people are working on it, the only thing I said was, well, it's very nice to add it, but I would like to have it first in theme control. So you can make a theme which fits with your way of co using color in the interface, and then have smart wireframe colors. So for example, you can set up rules for wireframe colors, if that groups have different colors, or modifiers, stuff, or constraints, or whatever. So you can use colors for debugging and useful information. If you would store the colors in the object itself, then it becomes very static. Then you get the file to somebody else, then you get a, a complete mess. Like you see the colors you might like, but I don't want that maybe. And then I have to spend hours of deleting or removing all the colors again. So if you make the colors a little bit more abstract, which is a few days of more coding time, everybody will be happy. But then I don't have to see your colors, and you can use the colors you like and load files from other people and have the colors too, the, your colors not their colors. You understand? More or less. Okay. Yeah, but the thing is so it's just a way of doing what's really good and not doing it the easy way you <laughs> might not want next year. Right? That's all. But I don't know what happened with it. I could comment on this, but I don't know if we should. So, <laughs> so there's opinion is divided. There's Ton's opinion. And well, there's, everyone has their own opinion on this. We had a big, long thread. It was really horrible. Um, <laughs> So basically, I mean, Ton's saying like you spend hours, but my implementation was just you click a button, it's like mad caps, and you en enable wi a wire colors. So you don't have to, it's like an opt-in thing. And this is like, maybe it's good, maybe not. There was a lot of disagreement there. Um, and the other thing is that Ton's idea is sort of like a, a rule-based colors, and that's good, but then if you just say, I want the grass to be a weird green color, you can't do that, you need a rule to define that. If you just say, I want the color to be what I want, that doesn't have a rule. You have to go and use some rule editor. No, you can assign the color, but you get the color from a palette, and you don't pick a color from your RGB picker. That's the only thing. So your palette is in theme control. Yeah. So if you set up a number of colors which you think is useful, then the same another user might have a different palette which yeah. fits with yeah. their themes, yeah. and then you can collaborate without seeing the ugly colors from the network. That's all. So instead yeah. of making RGB come custom for every object, you make a nice menu that pops up 16 colors and you pick one of them, or 32. Yeah. I mean, how does that uh, mix with group colors? And That's an index, index base. Yeah, yeah. That's all. But how does it mix with existing colors? How do you not conflict with library linking? By making this a rule. So the rule is done, I want a custom color. Okay. That's overriding the rules. And so if you don't like them, do you have to spend hours like turning off all the custom colors on every object? No. Good. Anyway, but we could, this is a matter <laughs> we'll of... We'll talk about it later. It's a, it's a matter <laughs> of design. <laughs> okay. It's a matter is of design. <laughs>
And the same thing is for the layer system in Blender, which could have named layers, and there's many ways to code an interesting layer system in Blender. There is a good way, and there is a way which is going to be something you will regret. That's the only thing. I kicked the code is not to be lazy, right? You have to not be lazy. But that's how Blender started. I've never, never been lazy in making things. Could, so could, could I? I really, really yeah. like to be the problem, I mean, that the layers is another completely thing. I understand Blender is not other software. I understand Blender is Blender. But when you change the way that other softwares are working, then you find problems. Like, for example, in my case, and I, I go again, like, obviously, the way I'm using Blender is not the, the way that the Blender is using Blender. But I have, I receive models from the architects. And those models, every software uses layers, every software. And the problem that I have is when I import the things, the, the sketch and model to Blender, I lose the layers. All the software, 3D Max, for example, is going to maintain that. It's going to maintain the, the name of the layers. So that's saving me one afternoon of things changing things in, 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 in Blender. And that's a big problem for me. Because if I have two days, I cannot spend <laughs> one afternoon putting things in. That, that, but that's, a, that's another completely thing. Like that. The only thing I want to say is that there's nothing against this, and I'm pro, pro, and we are think all pro, uh, good, having good features in Blender, but you have to expect also that it is sometimes work. You don't get it for free. It's not like that you have an idea <laughs> and then it materializes and it lands into Blender. That's not how coding works, right? That's not how anything works. Also, your job doesn't work that way. It's work. So for a developer, it also means you have to think about it, and think about the future and how to maintain it and really well, and then in a way that in 10 years of time you might still like it. So you have to do some thinking work, that's all. Yeah. Um, can I ask, is there any future for more parameters in Blender developing physical units? So I can switch between generic Blender units and meters or cubic centimeters. Um, but for lights, you know, is there any option that I might get a lux or a lux per square meter for the area light or something that's physically meaningful rather than just a number? So, it, so first sort of, uh, question is about is there a possibility, a possibility of adding more units? And this is uh, like most definitely, there is really nothing uh, difficult. It's I wouldn't say it's trivial, but it's quite easy to make dynamic unit systems. So you could register a new unit system, and then your add-on could use that unit system. So that's the sort of the first thing. I think that's maybe like one day's work, maybe two days' work. However, if you want your rendering engine to use those units, I think Cycles is not physically based with its lighting. It, it doesn't necessarily. Well, so I don't know anything about Cycles actually, but from what I understand, <laughs> well, it, no, it uses internally the un units correctly, but it doesn't necessarily expose them the same way to the user interface because sometimes you change the ranges and stuff, so it's more intuitive to use. So I don't know if there some parameters are actually physically based. Well, then sure you can add a unit; it's not a big deal. But if it's not, then what you know you cannot actually. For example, if sometimes you just want to have a parameter from zero to one. Right, instead of some some weird physical unit that nobody really understands, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, some people. Yeah, of course. But like, how many people know what? Uh, how many west watts per, squ per square meter you need for a light or something like that, right? I don't know how many people here can do that. You're wrong, um, but, uh, <laughs> but the, you know, so the reason you're wrong is that 60 watts is the figure you just quoted for. Everyone knows what a light is. Actually, it's not 60 watts anymore. It's 60 watts equivalent because we're not using um, um, heat, heat, uh, heated metal anymore. As a result, light bulb boxes now quote the intensity in lux as well. So people are becoming familiar with what a, a 5 lux, 6 lux bulb actually is. Um, may I give an answer to that? Maybe uh, there's a, a the thing is uh, with uh, the, uh, the path tracing, it's, it's quite difficult to uh, quantize this uh, uh, this thing. So in physics, you have basically photons. So you have uh, the luminance, which is uh, 
uh, the amount of photons that are emitted by a certain uh, black body, whatever. And uh, basically, path tracer works by shooting rays from the camera and then tracking a, a light. So you cannot, uh, so you, if you wanted to quantify the, the amount of light that is emitted by a certain lamp, you would have to do bidirectional uh, lighting, which we don't have now. So you would have to basically have the area of the light and then have a, a certain possibility uh, uh, distribution so that you can emit light from it and uh, to, have, to, have, to have some certain physical meaning. But in the path tracing, is a little bit ill-defined so you, because you cannot sample from the light uh, uniformly, that's the thing. Yeah, and, and a I, further I think, I think at least, uh, don't take my word as. Uh, and of course, we can start labeling buttons with units, but you also want those units to make sense, right? And that's the problem. So we don't always make sense in Blender because Blender is so flexible. You can define a planet to be the size of one unit, or you can uh, define an atom to be the size of one unit. So how are you going to map all those things, right, in physics? No, no, I don't want to know that. But that's okay. <laughs> you've already you've already solved that problem by having that scale factor as well as the specification of the units. So you were smart enough to have fixed the problem. And I'm, I might be unusual, but when I'm modelling planets, I do define them to be 10,000 kilometres across and set the scale so they still fit in my viewport. But then I think physically. <laughs> Just a, just a very quick question. Uh, who here compiles Blender? Their own Blender. And for you, after we changed from SVN to Git, was it better? Was it worse? Did people stop compiling because of that? Who hates Git? <laughs> <laughs> There's only one. <laughs> who knows what Git is? <laughs> OK. Uh, excuse me, because probably I might be not that experienced uh, as you all in this room. Uh, at first, I bow to you, developers. Thank you for the tool that we are using. And, uh, the second thing is that my work, basically, uh, is about collaboration and making people work with Blender. I'm not really, I, I do know Blender very well, but I, my job is to make, make people work with it. And uh, so collaboration comes to uh, to, to the uh, table and uh, first we've got uh, link links and it works for the most part so it's good but on the other side um, we have people with different specialities and uh, it is possible to customize blender but you're really customizing the blend file in most cases and when you pass the file through the pipeline everybody makes his own interface and everybody makes his own decisions about it so this is one question about collaboration, and are you thinking about maybe giving us the possibility to open the blend the way we want to? You understand that the person doing the shaders is needing a totally different UI. But on the, uh, the second question is, are you thinking, yeah? There's already the option to load without interface. You know that. Yeah, yeah. But you. Yeah, yeah, yes, but on the other hand, uh, it would be very great to have like uh, possibility, for example, to share those things to people. Uh, in a way that, for example, ZBrush is doing it with this Sculptris tool, which is just a ZBrush but shrinked, to give it to education and to give it to, um, for example, if I'm tr trying to show somebody who's doing Photoshop only uh, how to use Blender, I don't give him the original one. I just give him the template. I can do it. Yeah, I can prepare such a template and give it to a 2D graphic designer to, to show him how to use Blender with this specific interface. But don't you think that it would be good to think about those templates or think about uh, some kind of projects that you can give to people and make them uh, use the Blender much more familiar way. N n not showing such a versatility, maybe, but then giving them much quicker uh, access. I know a bit of the template discussion we've been having before and there's somebody who wanted to work on it, but there's a man, you, you mix up a couple of things, I think. So there is uh, the fact you don't, sometimes you want to only have the data file and don't want to share all the interfaces because you made it personally. Sometimes you want to make template files, which is a number of files which you can give to a user, and they will start up as if it's like a startup, right? So you start, you start Blender and you get the template, so you pick a number of templates, 
En dan moet je zeven vaal, dat is zeven de tempel heeft over, is zeven de vaal. Right? That's what you want. Which is almost there. There is some, somebody working on it, but it's not there yet, because it has uh, some issues and things. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so it's a matter of kicking a bit, and then it will happen. And just to say, the template file thing is there, just no one added the menu to access it. That's how close it is. Yeah. Sorry, Rusty. No, no, he will tell you after this uh, how to do it. We didn't do it yet because we wanted to sort of agree how it would work and like think of you know what directory we store templates in and how you save a new template. So it's a, it's not hard, but we we want to don't want to just add it uh, flippantly and then not think about the repercussions. But sure, it's it's basically there. I want to ask about well, thanks a lot first of all, and I want to ask about metaballs and. It, would it be possible to have modifiers on metapoles? Is it uh, too complicated? Is no, 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 I'm not talking about really complicated. <laughs> well, I mean, Tom calls metapoles. So I call it in nineteen forty. Nineteen. That was ages ago. I coded it in 92, and it was added to Blunder, and in uh, 2002 or three or four, there was a Finnish developer fixing up some little things for it, and that's it. I haven't seen the real use case for it, and there's not many people. <laughs> But what, no, no, so what are you doing with metaballs? What is uh, well, uh, I, <laughs> um, for in, I work with uh, scientific research, and for instance, if the very uh, simple case of cell division, and you, if you want to make cell division with metaballs, which is the right way to go, or the most uh, easy way to, the easiest way to go, uh, you have static metaballs, and they don't move or whatever, like cells that they fluctuate the membrane or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if you just apply a, I think it's very complicated, but an ocean modifier, for instance, so you can uh, fluctuate the, this, it would be much more realistic. Yeah, I mean, for this, you probably would need to add like volumetric primitive, which would be like more usable in my opinion. And current metabolism is just horrible. And it's so much, a, it, it's so much, it's so much a stopper for dependency graph. So this new dependency graph, it probably just wipe them away. <laughs> It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have any other, um, you are not working in any alternative, that's, uh, I don't know. But uh, you, you talk about constru constructive solid auditing, right? Or not. So like the metabol system is actually a procedural definition of shapes, which you then combine with AND and OR operations, right? The CSG, constructive solid geometry or CSG modeling. And we don't have that at all in Blender, and there's no developer who could do it. So we, you have to do a call for coders to help us uh, getting this uh, very well integrated, including working with the dependency graph, right? We, we, we can make a call for someone to integrate an like, open VDB into like modeling pipeline. That, that would be real cool. Uh, the, it, it has a hell of a lot left of tools to work with volumes. Uh, yeah, but, but, but that's uh, what I understand how the metabolics are used by, I don't see the page now. Yeah, I, I want to say something to this topic because I'm not sure if you noticed that uh, there is actually a plugin implementation of this, which did somebody on Blender Artist. It's like a, a ISO surface from OpenVDB too, and it's uh, very useful for visualizing fluids because we have particle fluids, but no way to render them for years. And also, like uh, the possibility of, like I wanted to say, like uh, this use case for metabolism. There are many use cases like this uh, biologic uh, animations. I do it like very often, so there it would be very useful to be able to work with metabolism more advanced. But uh, uh, in fact, like an open VDB surfacing. 
algorithm would be much more solid probably and had more use cases, for example, this fluid. And uh, it's been already done by some Arabian guy and it's on the forum, but it's just in a form of, of an outside library. So can we contact, can he contact us with some probably patches or so? Uh, it would be great. Uh, yeah. I can find it and send you. <laughs> okay. I have a question regarding Alembic support. I don't know who's responsible. Yes. Um, will it be modifier based uh, so I can stack uh, another modifier on top of it? Um, we haven't quite decided on the design, I guess, but um, yeah, it, it would be nice to, to have it work in a sort of layered way that you can uh, execute a modifier stack partially, then cache the thing, and then have something like an additional subdivision on top of the cache result, for example. So you don't have to store the full subdivided mesh in the cache, for example. And can you include a uh, time stretch and offset? <laughs> Very useful them. Yeah, that's, that's more of a design problem. Technically, I guess it's not so difficult, but it's uh, a question of how we can support that in the Blender workflow. We, yeah, and the dependency graph. Everything is a dependency graph issue. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to talk about bugs. And I mean, it's just questions. Bugs? Yeah, bugs. It's 174 right now, but that's not the question. Yeah, it's working. It was it was 175 before we started this meeting. Yeah. Oh. One, yeah. <laughs> so I know each bug is different, but I would like to know uh, what time does it take to solve a bug, and what can we do, we user, to help you solve a good bug? I mean, I know bug reporting is important, so what can we do? Well, the first rule is definitely fill out the template. <laughs> we have so many bug reports where people don't uh, don't provide the information that we ask for. Um, so when when you when you report a bug, you have a mask which says which asks you about your operating system, your GPU, which Blender version you use, and also some clear steps on how to reproduce the issue and an example blend file. And some people just wipe that away and then say they are working on a project and they are having these modifiers and it doesn't work then we always have to uh, spend time on getting back to them and asking, can you please provide that info? So the first thing that would really help, and I'm not kidding, is to actually just provide all the info so we clearly see, and we, so we have a clear way on reproducing it. If we have to spend uh, time on guessing what's wrong, that's our time that we could spend on fixing the bugs. So that's the first thing I think it's important. Oh, <coughs> most of you have like access to multiple machines, like multiple computers, and if you can like spend time to trying to reproduce the same bug on another computer which you have access to, and we'll find like a way that hey yes, it's reproduced it there, then just report it. If you cannot reproduce it on like another computer, then it's probability that we would be able to reproduce the same bug is really low. And we cannot fix bugs if you cannot reproduce it. So just if you cannot test on like multiple machines it's it's, it would really help. It was a quick point. Uh, first, when we take time to answer to a bug report, etc., and we have, I mean, each week we close bugs because we do not have any return from the user. And that is frustrating, time losing, and we can even lose real bugs. I mean, it, they can remain in the code because we don't have the, the requested data to fix them, to investigate them. And that's for testing. And other, other thing, but sorry. Uh, what I can add, I mean, I think if, if you have an issue with Blender, you should always report it. But you, even when you have no idea, because then we can close it, and at least we know that there is an issue somewhere. But you cannot expect the bug tracker to be like your personal support forum. So there's many times where people say, help, our blender doesn't work, help me. <laughs> but, and then they post a bug report and then they expect a developer to come in and say, oh, that's, so, that's interesting, you have blender not working, what's going on there? <laughs> well, uh, well, 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 so you get this whole long thread of, of like a support forum where people try to find out together what's going wrong. And that's something, we can't afford that, right? Sometimes if it's an interesting issue, it might happen, 
but you cannot expect this to happen. But what you can expect to happen is that if you have a case which is reproducible with evidence in a blend file, which crashes Blender, which used to work before, that will always be fixed, always. So you got a decent answer on a report about how what we are going to do about that case. That's for sure. But between this reproducible case and the user who complains the blender doesn't work, you have a lot of shady things like, yeah, I mean, sometimes after five times clicking and doing something, blender crashes. And then how do you pin it down? I think this is something we might, it's a nice idea to do a workshop about that, right, at the conference, I always thought about that, because most of the bugs are really logical, but you have to know where to look at, how to handle it, to find out where the actual issue is. And as a user, you can really spend a bit of time, if you want 10 minutes, 15 minutes, trying to approach a bug from every direction you can think of, by removing one by one all the variables, Delete everything you don't need in Blender, remove 90% of the interface, remove the screens, uh, append the file, or do, do something until you find the smallest case that crashes. And then usually you have exactly that, what is the problem. Uh, just a last quick point. Uh, it's uh, very uh, important to test with the latest builds too. Because, well, even without uh, going to case we ha we have some reports with blender 269 or 268 still today but they are i mean they're scarce but using the latest release one one month after well you can very well report bugs that are already been fixed so we have a build build bot on blender which builds each night the current master it's very important to test your bugs with these builds to avoid Needless reports. Uh, Bastian, if I can add, um, we don't have the resources to test Blender on all previous versions of Mac OS X or on all Windows versions. We try to keep it working on a recent version and on a subset of machines that we do have. But if you have a Mac OS 10.6 or 10.5 machine, it might be better to upgrade. If you run unpatched Windows 7, it you should actually Windows XP, come on. Uh, we support use. Windows XP, but you need to be fully updated. Um, Vista, I try to support as best I can, but you need to be fully updated. And I get two reports a month, three reports a month with people that I have to have a discussion with, three, four messages back and forth to find out that they didn't update. So please update, especially Windows users. Please update. Um, two things about that. Um, for example, would it be helpful to make some of the fields in the bug tracker mandatory? So you have to fill them out, for example, the OS, because right now it, uh, he said m many of the fields aren't, aren't filled out. If you don't fill in the form, you should be using the form. Yes, but... Well, and I, I mean, in, and some, in, in some cases, it's just like pointless to, to, to request some fields because hey, it's reproduced on all the system I'm trying. Like, why to bother even to, to put it in and it would be like a frustration on bug submission. Okay. I think it's just like and making stuff more complicated. Use common sense. And yeah, just uh, common sense, uh, common sense is the best answer here. Like just and the second thing I maybe would do is, for example, what you said, test it with the latest build. That's a very important thing. I would just put a small video message because video is the most impactful thing for two minutes where, where you just explain once and uh, the website does the trick for you educating the people who submit bugs. I, I, I think someone made a video tutorial about how to submit bugs. I think that was Sebastian Koenig. That uh, was a... We had one of, in the previous book track we had a video of, uh, and it was used, but it didn't help either. People refuse to follow instructions. That's the nature of people, right? And then we simply ignore them. If the information is not good, then we simply say, sorry, the inf uh, you have to provide all the information in this report. Please do that, and until then, we consider this report to be closed. Done. Right next. Otherwise, we can't work. Carol. Hello. Uh, thank you all very much. You are gods, of course. <laughs> uh, but um, I was wondering, uh, Tom, you uh, also talked about it in the uh, beginning about um, 
Blender maybe becoming a uh, modular because uh, lots of people, lots of different kinds of people use it. And I was wondering, uh, could you and maybe the developers elaborate on that, how it would work? Like, uh, would you, for instance, in a node editor, like make a pipeline for yourself and then render out a version of Blender? Or how will it, how will it take form uh, in your <laughs> What What is your vision on that? Yeah, no. <laughs> That's something I didn't think of that part yet. No. <laughs> so, but you you mean um, for no, no system for pipelines or? Um, uh, if in the future Blender will become more geared towards specific users, or will it remain a blend of all the functionality? This is something we have to discuss with the developers. I will have to discuss with the developers. I think that's just a template issue. Hmm? That, I think that's just a template. Hmm? Like Blender itself would be like versatile and just different like templates. Like, hey, I want to start as a VFX guy and I want like VFX layout and only that button. And sorry if I'm a sculptor, I will only like have one screen with sculpting. Um, but but, but the Blender itself would stay the same. It's just like a matter of like skinning. Huh? Isn't this done by layouts already? You have the on the top many default UV, mm, I don't know animation. Yeah, to some degree, but if you, sometimes you just don't want to have like some layouts or some screens, and you don't want like if someone gives you a file which was like f came from Modeler and you're working on like VFX, you don't probably want to open his layout. You want you want to use your own layout. So it's just like. A bit, a, a bit of an extension of current systems. So, uh, as optimal key mappings for workflows. Uh, that because if you uh, have one key map for all users, then some users have to use very obscure keys or for Control Alt Shift uh, F7 X or something. <laughs> well, I mean that's why why we want to have a more workflow attention in Blender. I mean, there is no space in the interface anymore to add buttons. I think there is no free space on the keyboard anymore. I mean, we could add stickies, and then what? And then the stickies are being uh, conquered and taken over by the, ma uh, the pie menus, and then when somebody invents something else, and then we have, we have to stop coding because there is no space anymore in Blender. <laughs> so we, we have to pull the brake a bit and say, okay, let's go back. Uh, in, uh, what I promote, and that's what I have to convince the guys behind me still of, but I think they like the idea of trying to get uh, the standard configuration for Blender, what we call default, to completely make it as so small as possible and only add as a default the things we totally agree on. So we don't have all the discussions anymore. So if we agree on it, it becomes a default. If we don't agree on it, then you put it in your own personal configuration. Because people are personal, people do have different opinions and ideas about what is logical. Like uh, a typical example is, for example, the up arrow, which suddenly a couple of years ago became a next keyframe, which is a typical useful key for an animator. But for uh, people who do uh, visual effects or something, it, it might not be very uh, sensible. So then you have a shortcut, which is nice for animators, but not nice for other people. What do you do with that? Then you get a discussion about whether or not to do this. And then the uh, game people say, yeah, well, we want to have the P, right, for the play of the games. When other people say, but I hate that P key. Every time when I press it, then it starts a f game, what? <laughs> uh, so that's, that's that kind of thing. We should try to get rid of that. But if you are a game artist, it's not uh, too much uh, required, too much demanded, that you configure Blender once for your workflow, everything is beautiful and perfect, and then we as a developer team have to make sure that everything we consider default easily merges with your personal configuration without any conflict or any problem. Right? Well, I actually have the idea of uh, having some bricks of key maps, key maps so you can um, build your own key maps out of uh, some predefined bricks. So, uh, for example, rotate scale and something like that. Uh, you ca could have G, R, and S, but um, we could also have a, a brick where you have it on uh, what's a, a, a small group of, of uh, key sets. So better, um, yeah, the, uh, organization, yeah. So you could uh, choose your own 
bricks, your own uh, set of key maps, yes, your own keys, and um, put them together to match your workflow, basically. What is also really cool is that uh, 3D technology and interfaces are evolving as well to get rid of buttons. You can see it. So there is at the moment, the moment you can see nice tests and videos of people who do uh, set up a rig and they hide the controls for manipulating it inside of the mesh. So you can then click on a finger and then you move it and then you get the hand and you move the hand, right? And you pose a character by touching it. That's the way how you do it. You want the controls and things and buttons and sliders and all those kind of things. So that's why sculpting is so cool. Sculpting is really a more natural way of working with modeling than trying to select a vertex and, uh, and another vertex and a different edge and then you extrude it and you extrude that. But that kind of modeling, although it's cool, but it's a bit old, right? Nowadays, you can sculpt holes in meshes and you can add things. So you can, what? Almost. Yeah. So, this, uh, so the whole sculpting thing is becoming useful. And then making a topology is becoming also very easy. So instead of trying to get good topology while you model, you can first sculpt something so, you, so that you're satisfied with it, fast, nice, interactive. <coughs> then you give it uh, to a topology guy or you do it yourself with the tool, and then you have a good model. So those kind of tools also change. And most of that, that's the cool thing, you don't need buttons for it. If you saw the, the, the topo tool uh, from Jonathan, it's mostly 3D. I don't think you have buttons. No, a few. And that's the cool thing. Yeah. That's that's good tool design, I think. Um, thanks for making Blender. I think it's a. I think it's really a fantastically ergonomic tool that you can set up and customize really well. And my question is, um, I would love to be able to use that power of the interface to work on uh, sounds in much more detail. For instance, if there was synthesizers built into Blender and you could set up drivers to where the position of an object drove the frequency of a sound and uh, those kinds of things. I was wondering if there's any thoughts to develop more of a sound uh, generating a sound palette kind of toolkit within Blender, perhaps within the node system. have uh, one sound developer who really would like what you say too. He's uh, into 3D sound and MIDI and that kind of things. Uh, he's not always having time and has his own things to do as well. So I'm not aware of development in this area really. I mean, I think people have done some weird stuff with Jack and I mean you can define your own nodes so you could probably do some hackery with Python and maybe get something interesting but for something like built into Blender that's supported everywhere that's it's going to have to be um, like properly coded in C, I think. What happened to the project to add MIDI control in Blender? You remember that one? It was a long discussion like five years ago. No, I don't The event queue can be MIDI controlled. Yeah, people have been doing OSC and MIDI input and crazy stuff for yeah. a while, but it's always really like custom stuff and they use some Python module to get OSC and it's like for some installation and then it gets forgotten about. But Tim worked on it? or? Tim? Oh, so I thought you wanted to give the mic to him because he knows everything about it. Uh, no. <laughs> you wanted to be, get rid of the problem. Uh, so do people you, uh, know OSC, like the, the open source standard for MIDI and stuff? Is that useful to have in Blender? Yeah, yeah. What for? Well, first, okay, well, the, the most straightforward answer would be like for Think of color grading. You know, these people that like to have these strange color grading oh, setups okay. with all the cool, colorful buttons. wheels. Yeah, buttons. Yeah. Right, physical buttons, you know. <laughs> well, the the easiest, well, it's not really the, the easiest way to hook up with, with directly because you need to make some kind of a bridge application for that. So I, I see how it's not really that easy and straightforward to do. But yeah, it would be really appreciated. Right. Be also nice for video editing services and stuff too. And those panels, they all work with OSC. So you could set up OSC to go into the Blender event queue and then control all those things. Yeah. 
just like Yulis showed yesterday on their uh, lead motion thing. <laughs> it was using OSC. The, la the latest demo, the one where actually scaling up the, the drive, was using OSC. So it's pretty stra stra straightforward. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. As, so I just uh, wanted to wrap up the, the sound thing. So I think there can be a lot learned from how sound people set up their systems because there's crazy stuff going on in terms of development of MIDI controllers and stuff. And there's then like an unlimited supply of buttons, so we have that <laughs> problem out of the way. <laughs> uh, okay. But my actual question was uh, because it has been said so many times that people should. Uh, seize the business opportunity and uh, open up uh, support business for Blender. So the thing, uh, it's been said so often that I now s seriously consider it, but uh, the thing I find very uh, intimidating about it is that uh, Blender is such a complex piece and, and s such a modular thing that um, I don't see how anyone could possibly uh, offer like a rel reliable support that, that just helps you it just definitely helps you if, if you have a problem because I think there, there will be a lot of bugs where I'm very, uh, where I very much have to rely on the core developers to uh, get information. So I would like to have your thoughts on that, how we can tackle this together, for instance. Oh, Don can answer that question. It, uh, I, I mentioned it in the other uh, in the theater as well. It's coming back a lot, what you mentioned, that topic. So there is an issue in uh, demand, whatever it is, and then there is a need for a developer. And then how do you find those people? So how do you get them to code for you, right? That's what you want to know. More yeah, it's especially, um, I'm thinking like, okay, like a, a practical scenario. So I have a support contract with someone, and then he comes like, oh my god, tomorrow is the deadline and everything has to run and now help me. And I'm like, okay, I, I can know a lot of about Blender, but not every... I mean, really what you, you know, having done a bunch of Blender support, basically somehow or another you need to get a Blender developer on staff that can fix the bug. Um, whether that is somebody that is actually contributing to master or not, you know, at least as far as support contracts goes, particularly if you're supporting l larger studios or any kind of studio institution, they don't necessarily need to get the bug fixed in master, they need to get the bug fixed for them. So if you can get a de developer on staff, whether that's part of the core team or not, uh, that can then fix the bug and then ship the person a custom build, at least for their project, then that would definitely be a solution. You know, Ideally, there would be somebody that can also contribute both to their personal projects, but also to support and to master. But as there's not very many people, um, but yeah, that's the, that's really the challenge, and that's honestly one of the challenges that I've run into, and a lot of other people have run into, is how do you get a developer on staff? Um, that's the guy who used to be on the uh, John Denny. Uh, John, are you in here? Yeah, he's over there. Yeah, so, so, I mean, just as kind of a similar example, so with the retopology tools that uh, Tom mentioned earlier that we built, I don't know how to build those, um, particularly with the math side. It's way over my head. But I designed the tools and then just reached out to a few developers to actually build it. And those are in Python, so they're not actually building on Blender Master, but they do a lot of things. And that works out really well, particularly you know on a contract basis or as an employee or whatever, to get a developer on the team to actually work with. Uh, I was, in fact, already uh, taking that into account that I ship a custom build to the customer. But still, I think the problem remains, like, I can offer support for one add-on, that's, that's okay, because I can understand it, it's, it's my work, but uh, Blender is like very, this very interdependent, and one system can fuck up another, and I can't understand everything, and, and no, no developer can, and so you have to have some sort of extra strategy in that case, and I'm asking you if you know, have any idea how that could look? Um, just a comment on what you said, I think there's this maybe incorrect notion that someone has to just know all of Blender to do Blender support, and I think there's maybe you could say two levels, but there's like, if you have a report that something doesn't work, usually there's a whole lot of, uh, sort of human factors involved, like they want to do certain things and maybe there's three ways to do it and they've got a complex rig and you need to figure out a solution for them. So you don't necessarily have to be able to go in and debug like cycles, ray casting, some sort of weird glitch or something like this. You, you just have to be able to kind of think rationally about it and spend a bit of time. 
And the, the other thing is, um, as Blender developers, we don't always understand the code that we fix before we fix the bug. Sometimes you get a bug report and you look at an area of code you haven't seen before and you have to think about it. It takes maybe two hours when it should have taken 20 minutes, but you still manage to fix it. So there are developers and smart people out there who can look at Blender's code and think about it and figure this stuff out and become better and become really good developers to work with, I guess. Yay for optimism. That's great, yeah. Yeah. There are so many people who already are work on Blender, and this is not the, the whole Blender development team. There's plenty of more who didn't come to the Blender conference. <laughs> so the issue is valid. So we have to find at Blender.org or Blender Foundation better ways to connect people for this. And people should be treating this as a professional topic. It's not about, I want to have a feature in Blender, I want to have it in the release, but it's like, I have uh, a prof an issue with uh, making something, like Monica doing uh, molecular visualization. She can't uh, have more than 10,000 molecules because she's doing things in the code not well, or that conflicts with something in Blender, and she has a development bottleneck. Somebody has to help her. How do you solve that, right? For her, that's an impossible problem because she can't find who can solve these kind of things. So we have to set up some kind of an infrastructure, maybe on the Blender network. We have to find a place where you get some kind of a marketplace where you can, people can come together to help each other, which is not about getting stuff in the release, because that's a whole different problem. It's about specifically helping this person to get, oh, there she is, Helping Monica to get her bio blender back to working state, right? That's what it is about. Okay. Who's, who's the oldest hand? How old? Um, just rough curiosity here, just from a, sort of the show of hands on the developers. How many of the core developers that we have here would do Blender development full time? Do, do it currently, full time. And, and of those of you who, who don't currently do it full time, how many would like to do it full time? Yeah. How, well, no, who, how many would like to do it full time, as far as Blender development goes? Um, well, no, the, re the, reason, the reason that I ask is that if anybody wanted to set up such a support system, there's the people you hire. No, there was some hand, yeah, there was a hand, Shula. Yeah, in uh, relation to uh, not enough developers, um, would it help to have uh, some of the core developers being mentors for the patch tracker, potential new developers who are interested, who are interested uh, in helping, but um, maybe uh, ignore, ignored uh, because you don't have enough time to help uh, mentor them and like foster uh, an, an inclusive uh, development uh, community. Like uh, it's just uh, I I don't know if it's true, but I uh, that's a lot of uh, patches. I think that's a lot of developers who who, who fixed scratch their own edge. They posted on the patch tracker and nothing happens for a year, and then say, well, screw this. I I'm not going to contribute. Uh, to this project, if they were helped or communicated with earlier, maybe there would be more developers for other projects for the Blender network. I don't know if a mentoring program would help and dedicate resources for that. Uh, we, what we do is we are the Blender Development Fund. We hire developers so they can work part time or full time on our bug tracker and reviewing. And that helps a little bit, but we do have to find ways too to get people who submit patches that they find their ways easier into the, the project. Like, how do you promote it? How do you get something in attention that it is really something useful? But there is a problem with patches. Patches have a very unique, different thing. And the problem sometimes is actually, sometimes it's a feature request. It's, a, it's a, a, sne a sneaky feature request that people want to have something in Blender and they code it and say, here's a patch, and then suddenly you have to review it and look at it and say, yeah, the code is not really good, you have to fix this and that and that. So in the end, you have to spend more time on reviewing the patch than on uh, coding it. And there's 
in the meantime, somebody has to feature in Blender as well. By submitting code which is not really good, you force somebody else to fix it and then add it to Blender, right? But that's, after a while, you get a bit tired of that and you start coding yourself and then you leave all the patches in the tracker for what it is. So that's a bit of the issue with the patch tracker. that's re related to that. It, thank you. <laughs> it's, could you explain what's the decision process like re relative to a new feature, a proposed feature, or to a patch? Because I've been following on IRC uh, uh, for some time and on the developer's mailing list, and I, I ha hardly ever see a feature being discussed even among amongst you like the pros and cons being laid out on the table and someone saying yes we should take it because of this and that and some other guy saying no it's not good because of that i hardly ever see these discussions and yet in the end indeed some features are, are cast out and others are into the next release and uh, it's hard I, I still don't understand how and in what bodies such decisions are taken of we've got like module owners in, in list and if the feature only belongs to like one area the module owner can decide whether it's good feature or not to have if there is uh, some uh, feature which touches different areas then we definitely have discussion sometimes it might be not like public one we sometimes pop each other like in a private mail or in pri private message in the ERC and talking about hey how do we handle this and then probably reply in the patch I do understand the model owner and it's perfectly legitimate, but uh, it's the discussion. I mean, the ultimate decision, I do understand why it, 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 it's in the hands of the module owner. It's, it's the process that I don't understand and don't, don't see. I, I think, well, sometimes I, I, uh, I worry a little bit because maybe two people have a discussion and it's not public and a decision is made and there is no record of that and that's a, like a problem for other developer, uh, developers because I have to say, hey Sergey, why did this happen? And he says, oh well I talked to Tan and he thought it was a bad idea. And then that's a bit, well, it doesn't scale very well for many people and it also, as you say, makes it sort of very opaque, the whole decision making process. Some controversial decisions, we pro probably do that purposefully but other times it's just the easiest thing to do to shoot off a quick mail to someone and, and get a reply. I, I agree, it's a problem. Uh, uh, Campbell? So just... Oh, I, I don't want to make it too, uh, too much of a personal issue. Indeed, I did, I did work for a number of weeks on a modifier that, that got attention and, and, and very positive feedbacks, and uh, Bastian even helped me polish it in the end. And then Campbell said, for a number of good reasons uh, that it, it wouldn't make it. And my issue is not so much that it's uh, ultimately a no decision. I, I do have the feeling that I should have been told not to work on this much earlier. And I wonder, indeed I was very new in all that, that contribution processes, so I, I, I certainly did many things wrong, but still, it's, it's, I mean, it would be best to avoid other people uh, doing the same mistakes that I did and working for weeks on things that will be trashed in the end. So that, that, that makes it personal, but really my question was, was more broadly how are decisions made? Um, just a, a comment that I've made many times, I think, but if you make a patch, always get the person who will review your patch to check your patch early on. Because if you do not do that, there is a high risk of having your patch rejected after all the work. And it's really frustrating for all, pi all people concerned. I, I'm not especially happy to be confrontational, so to go up to people on the internet and mail them who I've never talked before and say, hey, I don't like your patch. It's like sort of walking up to someone and saying you don't like a shirt or something. It's like, <laughs> because maybe they make it better and maybe they improve stuff and... <laughs> I know. Well, we could be like that. I don't know. Maybe it would help. But it's, it's difficult because when they're working on stuff and it's their own development, uh, they might say, well, I'm doing it for myself and it's for my own project. Uh, the other thing uh, developers will have to understand 
is the same thing is for artists. If you look at what uh, the artists do on a team when they make a film, they start drawing and drawing and designing and designing. And what you learn is that the process is far more important than what you do at that moment. So if you are a coder and you say, I spent weeks on this code and it has not been used, then you can also say, well, that has been a very useful experience, and now I'm going to do something which is better or, or more interesting. Or you say, I will use it myself, or I will frame it on the wall. But it's not like a waste of time to code. Code is really cool. Coding is fun. Coding is interesting. Even artists are coding. He doesn't expect the code to be ending up in Blender release. <laughs> But he does use it himself because it's useful to have to do and to have it. And I think so the, the need of making code because you need it yourself is of course the best thing you can do. So I hope uh, for coders that they don't get discouraged if your work is not accepted. It doesn't mean that you are a worthless human being or something. Of course not. It's not the same as for an artist, right? Move on, move on. Huh? But there's always new code to make. And people are even removing my code from Blender, you know that, right? <laughs> so all the old crap from the 90s, and so in a few years, there's nothing left anymore, right? So it happens to me as well. Just this quickly, this contact module owners early on, maybe they'll say definitely, or it's risky, we're not sure if we can accept it, but you can at least get a little bit of a kind of a, is this, am I going in the right direction? Or, or you can ignore their feedback and do it yourself anyway, and that's great, but then it's a high-risk project and you might not get it included. I also have a question about the evolution of code, um, more or less related to a bug report I sent in a few days ago. I was playing around, I'm teaching myself the, the, the Blender game engine, and I saw that there was, a, you could turn on pulsing and then you could say frequency. And I would expect that the higher the number in that frequency field, the higher the frequency of the pulses. But it's not, it's the opposite. It's the number of frames that are s for which pulses are skipped and then you get a new one. So it's more like the period than the um, uh, frequency. So I was wondering, I don't know myself how to fix that because it's, it's all the way back to the Python API. It says dot frequency while it should be dot period. How do you guys approach such a thing? How would you fix that? I mean, for such simple thing, you just drop on IRC, send a note, the uh, coder is here, he read it, he fix it, it's done in five minutes at most. <laughs> but yeah, sure, I mean, then you change the code, but. Oh, I've already. Yeah, you you can that. report and we, we can fix this, but this would also. Oh, it's one of the 147 bugs. So it's se seven fourths, sorry. Yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm just I mean wondering in general, how do you, um, as a team, do something like that where you have to change a property name in Python and there could introduce all kinds of compatibility well, pro issues? Property name, like UI name, is easy to change and you can like just contact like with a bug tracker or just like in the field mailing list. Changing the Python RNA name is a bit more risk because yeah. then we'll be blending, hey, you broke Python API, you have that's bastards. That's exactly what my question is about. So, so we try to not to on that level. We, we try to stick like to, to all legacy name just because of the compatibility. But so we usually in these cases, if it, if we really have to change it, you wait for a moment, maybe from 2.6 to 2.7, and you rename it, and you have it in the documentation. Ideally, that this has been broken, it will discover reason real quick, quick anyway. Uh, hi. What are the plans for development of the Blender internal, like in the long run? Uh, say because it often happens uh, that projects in similar situation get dro dropped uh, because it's too hard to divide resources to continue maintaining and extending the similar projects. And well, I currently am trying to fix bugs in Blender internal and probably at some point I will just go ahead and clean it up and make it like a bit more maintainable just because of bug fixes things. And maybe it would also help like attracting more developers trying to extend it like a bit more for some better features and stuff like this. 
Ja, ik had huis hier sinds toen kind. Toen is working on a tour, right? Yeah, he is working a, a bit on a tour, yeah. He's not very visible or communicating a lot. We should have to hunt him a little bit down, where he is, and then mail him, and maybe he wants to be involved by uh, us reaching out to him, giving yeah. him hints or ideas. Yeah. Maybe Shinsuke is watching. I don't know. How can we know? Like, <laughs> do, do we have like, feedback from the internet back? It's just like... <laughs> but anyway, but things are evolving in Blender, and that's... Uh, Blender internal render is falling behind, right? And that's not because, but it's, it's because it's huh, a weird echo. No. But it's, it's falling behind, and that's for many reasons. And to catch up things, you also need to know where do we want to bring it to? What's the future? But for cycles, it's much more clear because there are many open issues and cycles which have to be worked on at the production engine. It has to uh, improve in many areas. But for Blender internal, it's like, yeah, um, what are we going to do with it? That's uh, why I'm actually asking this is like, I see a lot of people excited about cycles in general and like, oh my God, like, and, but like, uh, in our case, we're using Blender internal only because it's quicker and it's much easier to compromise on things when we can compromise. But recycles, it's, it's much more harder to script it and much harder to achieve the same rendering quality uh, within the time frame and all that. So for our case, it's critical that Blender internal stays there. But what I see, it kind of uh, gives me an impression that at some point, it's quite possible that Blender internals will like be dropped from the maintaining now. Well, well I... I I, d I don't <laughs> think it will, it will be gone in any, like, in, in nearest first annual. So, okay. that's... Okay, the decade is fine. Well, the, the, the thing why Cycles started in the first place, I mean, Brecht worked on refactoring Blender internal for the Sintel project, and most of that work uh, didn't end up in master because it was too buggy, unfinished, or I don't know exactly. But that was one of the reasons why Cycles uh, was born. So um, yeah, with Blender internal, we we are more or less in a maintenance only mode for the last two two years or so. We we fix bugs, we occasionally add a small feature, but that's it. And I mean, the main reason for that is because it has so many issues. So if uh, I mean no issues in Blender internal. Ah, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. uh, no, but yeah, there are all ab about like uh, material nodes and passes. Ah, come on, come on. <laughs> They're not using material notes, are you? Oh. No, so basically all I want to say is that uh, Blender internal is of course still a great render engine and you can do a lot of things with it and especially for non-photorealistic stuff it's great. But it's difficult to bring it from the current level to, to the next level simply because it's, you, of course it's quite okay to fix bugs but getting it to a whole new level is difficult and that's maybe one of the reasons why, why it's more or less in a maintenance mode at the moment. So for, for me, there, been, there are many ways we could move forward, but I don't know yet which one will be the way. But one is the, the NPR and the people, because the non-photorealistic. I mean, in the current computer graphics standards, Blender internal is not photorealistic. I mean, it might be photorealistic in the 90s, but at the moment it is not photorealistic anymore. So the, you could call it an NPR render engine and we could maybe get the people who are interested in getting the whole range from uh, a cartoon render to a uh, really cool, interesting, creative renders, which is easier to manage or faster, we could help or maybe get them involved. And the other thing we could look at, which is also interesting, is to move to OpenCL 3 and 4 features. And then you get something really interesting, because actually Blender internal looks quite a lot like what you can do now with real-time graphics. And then you have it real-time, which is even better, right? And then you can uh, beat the shit out of those cycles, guys. <laughs> but then you have something with 10 point, one point second per frame render time, right? Yeah. But, but I actually do have a question about like this topic. Do you have like some missing features in Blender internal? Do you have like some bugs or is it just worrying 
about like it's been discontinued at some point. So. Thanks. Well, so I have a comment and maybe two questions. First of all, I would like to say big thank you and bow to all of you developers. We are really pros, kudos for you and respect. So my question is a bit maybe small, but I would like to ask you what about uh, video sequence editor? This is uh, about few years. Uh, he is uh, missing features a bit. I have to recently work a lot with it. So it definitely needs some more love, I feel so. So it, It's just terrible, and we suffer the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, basically, uh, we're trying to uh, improve some things. I am not a video sequence editor at all, so any feedback I try to, to gather around from people who do work there. And it's a little bit uh, weird because it's been developed using some sort of standards uh, that people expected at that time, and now standards have changed, and maybe we should, people who use it, we should really gather together and make a direction that we want to have for the sequencer and uh, we, you know, what really has to be done. And basically, right now for the Gooseberry project, we're trying to solve some uh, basically speed issues and uh, uh, cache issues so that we you can get some uh, proxy images showing up quickly and uh, transform system working properly. But I guess if we really want to uh, make a modern thing, it's more uh, long-term uh, targets than we have to you know sit together all the users and see what we want to do and uh, I guess uh, the way to organize this is a little bit uh, it's a little bit first come first served we have to advertise it basically so people can uh, can contribute to it and get heard somehow that's the thing but maybe, it's, it's maybe we all should increase vendor development funds to, to sponsor you or to support you in some way by the way who is in this fund already I would like to ask you, raise your hand. Who, parti who is participating in Blender Development Fund already? Yeah, I think that is maybe a good way to support some progress. And the second question, just to be quick. Do you know somebody who was willing to improve Blender so dramatically that he tries to become a developer, to change his whole life and go this way, to learn himself how to code and to add new features? Was, it in, was that case already happened to some of you? other guys can tell me if this is their experience but I just started working on Blender I'm not like an ex expert on mathematics or anything and you just keep on working it and it's just really fun and I just didn't stop and I ended up getting a job so I, I left my other job and it was I didn't ever feel like really really hard at any point um, and I don't have qualifications in this area so yeah it's rather the same thing but started working on small plugins to small add-ons to improve my experience and then I had an idea of modifiers and then yeah <laughs> louder so just a quick parenthesis you don't need to just drop your job and your life and become a developer and everything changes you might have used <laughs> no I'm just saying that you saw the, the drone presentation I gave with Fabian Lati yesterday it was really handful to really handy to be able to patch Blender, to be a Blender developer on call, even for your own projects, even if you're not full time or only part time, dedicate your your life to Blender. So there's a lot of compromise in in, in this. Uh, keep Blender development here. I mean, it's much more fun than being like involved like full time because of the bug tracker and patch tracker <laughs> thing. <laughs> Only for four weeks now, but I, I was doing much more. No way. <laughs> Can I stay here? <laughs> uh, 
quick question about uh, just relating to MPR. Would it be possible at any point, I know that you guys are planning to take what's in the game engine and integrate that across uh, other parts of Blender, would it be possible at any point for someone to directly write like an open uh, GLSL shader um, and use that in place of the current material system? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> oh, yes, it's part of the, there is this ongoing thinking on how to have PBR support in the viewport and it's all tied to the viewport uh, branch as well. We even have a branch, the Fukuto GE Harmonix 2, I think, which supports the, it's for the Blender Game Engine, but without, outside the Blender Game Engine, you can already have your own GLS materials, but part of the new viewport project would allow this kind of setting. Okay. Okay, short comment about uh, Blender support system. I think uh, there should be a division between uh, support uh, for existing Blender features and uh, support for adding features so that you uh, you get a question and then you give it to someone with special with a specialty and a premium feature would be that a coder would code it for you. So that w that's my idea about Blender support. Question about Cosberry targets because they are quite ambitious. Do you think that you will have time to achieve all the targets and is there a roadmap with the priority? No. <laughs> Uh, what what are the current plans for Blender UI improvements, and what about the new key map? I, I heard that there's something going on in this uh, area. Uh, I mean, there's a few different plans. The primary one, there's kind of, well, two big plans. First one, as far as general UI improvements, is to finish a lot of the Blender 2.5 projects on Tons list and such. Um, there's also a lot of little things, just like small incremental improvements that won't really be that dramatic to the user, but they make things a lot nicer. As far as the key map goes, the main plan right now is to build a completely new, much more simplified key map that's much more friendly for newer users. It's simplified, easier to customize, um, and it's also much more consistent. And then that will potentially be released as like an alternative. And then if it's really well received, maybe made the default. Uh, while then the current key map will always be available as well. Uh, that just has to be finished. I'm trying to get it done. <laughs> um, the, but the biggest thing is mostly consistency, because just as, if any, anyone's wondering, just because it's come up in discussion a lot, at least over the conference, and it comes up on, on Blender Artists all the time, is a lot of people ask, which is like, you know, why don't we change left, left click select or that kind of thing? And mostly it's just to oh. preface, the main issue is not what mouse button is selected, it's that there's different selection presets in basically every single editor right now. So if you change it to left mouse, some things become right mouse, other modeling tools become right mouse, it's all over the place. So that's one of the main things is that has to be made consistent in the key map. Hey, I wanted to ask if there is any plan to do something with the NLA editor, or more specific with animation layer, or proper animation layer. I would use it if it was possible. One person uh, working on it is that Joshua, I, Josh, and uh, we have to talk to him. There's not a lot of interest in it. It does work to some level, but it's a bit ignored. And, uh, okay, very quick. Last one. Um, just um, how do I approach you if I have a design for a, a feature or improvement, like uh, for the text? You can't really uh, specialize uh, or special a text like the. Um, the text tool is really bad, so and I have some ideas. How do I approach you and just blunder.org? Get involved. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you. <laughs> the developers.
Someone left the earrings on the table. A woman most likely left earrings on the table.